that we would begin this week a study on the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to turn with me in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 23, through 5, 1 through 5. We're only going to look at the Galilean ministry as it leads into the first three Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought in him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that there are nine Beatitudes and there are nine fruit of the Spirit. And some of the fruit of the Spirit are the characteristics of the kingdom. For example, meekness is one of the Beatitudes. So now as we look at this, we want to see about developing that mind of Christ because to have the mind of Christ, as presented by Paul, you have to be self-sacrificing. You have to practice humility. And you have to love others. And in having the mind of Christ is necessary for us to allow the principles and characteristics of that kingdom to be perfected in us. If we don't know what Christ's thinking is, and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, we will never get to the place that we will develop those characteristics. Nobody is born of man and born with the characteristics of the kingdom. Just like the mind of Christ is imputed to us, but it also learned the principles and the character of the kingdom, we have to learn. And we have to discipline ourselves. That's what it means about being disciple. The word discipline comes from that word disciple. And it means that we have to not only be born again, and that's great to be saved, but we're supposed to be disciples of the Lord. We're supposed to accept His teaching as divine truth. And there is no other truth than that absolute truth of God. And in doing so, we discipline ourselves according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. As Christ emptied Himself to serve mankind, we must also empty ourselves of the things which prevent us from serving mankind. Many of us need to empty ourselves of biases, of prejudices. I saw a, a part of that uh, this morning on the news. It was, it was disturbing. Two white young men were in a multicultural area. And they were studying. They weren't bothering nobody. <clears throat> One of them had on his computer, Blue Lives Matter. Well, that's alright. I think... Law enforcement lives do matter. But two young black women came in there and guess what word they used? I'm offended. Mm. I'm offended by you. And because you have that tag on your computer, you're a racist. Mm -hmm. Now I can tell you who the racist was and it wasn't the two white boys. Mm -hmm. That's right. They were gentlemen. I think I would have got a little bit of uh, irony and spoke back at them, but they did it. And they said, I didn't mean to offend you. It wasn't our purpose in offending you. Well, friends, if you go around being offended, nobody can get around you. And it's sad to say there are people today of all colors that are looking just to be offended. I was offended at the way they behaved. But I wasn't there to tell them that I was offended at the way they behaved. We must be like Christ and put away 
any prejudices or biases. That way we know when they use those aggressive terms, it means nothing to us. Because we can say, I'm a Christian. And Jesus told us in the Word that many people would be offended by the Word of God. And to some it would be a stumbling block. And it is. When you hear the truth, the truth will offend you. That's right. Particularly if you don't want to hear it. And so we need to realize that there is a true offense. Sin offends God. Mm-hmm. And I'd be a lot more concerned about sin than if somebody's pants are up or down. Amen? Even though that offends me. Mm-hmm. We are Christians as the light of the world and the salt of the earth, and people are to see Christ in us. We are the only Christ that they're going to get to see. We are supposed to exemplify Him. We're supposed to, when they see us, see the light of God in us. So that if we are more of ourselves out there, then we put a bushel over the light because they don't see Jesus. We need to take the bushel off. And we need to let them know the love of God. And we need to let them experience the love of God. And we need to practice towards them the love of God. No matter what they say, no matter what they behave, we have to be right. Amen? Amen. So when we look at this, understand this. In order to have the principles and the character of the kingdom perfected in us, we must have the attitude, the disposition, and the character of Christ which is revealed in these Beatitudes. We need to practice these Beatitudes. I used to think, well, now what do they call them Beatitudes? Because it's attitudes that need to be. Amen? Amen. It's attitudes we need to present. Has anybody told you you had a bad attitude? Some have. Yeah. Sometimes somebody said you got a bad attitude. Well, that means they saw something in you that they didn't like. But the attitudes of Jesus are not bad attitudes. They are good attitudes. They are the attitudes of the kingdom. They are the attitudes that Jesus presented Himself. And notice... Jesus was no wimp. Jesus told the holier than thou religious leaders that they were full of dead men's bones. He called them vipers and snakes. He calls them the children of the devil. So he was quite pronounced in what he said. But the end thing he said it was, he said it with authority and he said it with love. He didn't say it in a way, okay, I'm cutting you off because I just told you that. He said, I'm putting to you a fact so you can change your life. And if you will believe on me, I will forgive you. And you will have eternal life. God always acts to bring people to Him, not to drive people away. So you need to ask the church, if people are being driven away from the church, what part of Christ is not there? People ought to be drawn to the church. Amen? The behavior in the church and outside the church should draw people to the church. In other words, when you say to somebody, I'm attending the Grace Community Church in Perkins, Georgia, they should say, well, yeah, I heard about that church. It's a praying church. It's a loving church. It's a church that's concerned about people. They're small, but they have big hearts. That's what we need to hear out there. And I want to tell you, that's a truth. You do have big hearts. I've, pra- I've pastored some large churches. One of the churches I've pastored, you outdid this last Thanksgiving. As big as they were, they could come up with four boxes. You came up with six to feed those who needed it. Think about that. As small as our church is, we have such a big heart. And giving heart that we could reach out and help folks that couldn't help themselves, particularly during this pandemic. Now, when we come to the ministry in Galilee, Jesus' threefold ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing were demonstrated in Galilee, starting with Matthew 4.23. He taught in their synagogues. Now, the synagogue was a development during Israel's exile when they were not able to attend the temple because of its destruction and their bondage. It took ten adult Jewish males to form a synagogue. If you didn't have ten adult Jewish males, you couldn't have a synagogue. 
Now these synagogues, which help the Jews keep their traditions and their understanding of the law, still existed even when the temple was built again. And so Jesus is in Galilee, where one of these synagogues are, and He's teaching in them. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. What is that gospel? The gospel or good news of the kingdom revealed that the presence of the king on earth brought near the rule of God on earth. The king was on earth. And because King Jesus was on earth, the king of heaven was here with him. He was showing to them, if you accept me, the kingdom of heaven will be now. But if you reject me, the kingdom of heaven will be by and by. And kingdom of heaven now will be by and by. Because they rejected him. <coughs> Prerequisites for entrance into the kingdom included repentance, righteousness, childlike faith, and the need to be born again. You must be born again if you expect to see the kingdom of heaven. Amen. He healed all manner of sickness and disease among the people. That's why we need to understand what drew the multitudes to Jesus. It was more than just His teaching. It was the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. How beautiful it was, the quote that Valerie just shared with us about the devil. Because we see here where Jesus is showing the devil had no power. That he was able to cast the devils out. He was able to get rid of the demons. He was able to heal the lunatic. God has all power on heaven and earth. Isn't that what Jesus said? All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore. If he has all power, what does that mean? That means there's nobody else who's got any power. That's what that means. It means that He has all authority on earth. And why did He have all authority on earth? Because He obeyed the Father. He willfully went to the cross. He willfully suffered and died. And He rose again on the third day like He said He would. Amen. Amen. Death could not hold Him down. The devil thought He had Him beat. And the only thing the devil did was shoot himself in the foot. <laughs> Amen. The devil, the Bible says if the prince of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew they were releasing the power of God and the power of salvation, they would have never sent Jesus to the cross. But that's exactly what happened. Because the cross is the power of God unto salvation. His fame was spread throughout Samaria. Think about it. I guarantee you, when all these things began to happen, the lunatics were being healed, the palsies were being healed, when all these sicknesses and diseases were being healed, people talked about it. Amen. Don't you know when God touches somebody in a hospital and somebody knows somebody prayed for them, people want to know about it. They want to know who prayed for them. They were so close to death, but somebody came and prayed and they got out of the hospital. Who prayed for them? You see, that power is still with us today. You have the power of faith. Amen. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Be thou removed in the sea and it be moved. God says, I've given power to the people. You have the faith to pray for one another. You have the faith to believe God who said that by His stripes you were healed. Amen. If we will only believe, that's all it takes. All things are possible with God if we will only believe. They brought to Him all sick people that were taken with various diseases and torments, those who were possessed with devils, those who were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and He healed them. Do you know there's, there's a sad statement in the Bible? In Mark, I believe it's Mark chapter 6. When he came into his own home and he could not do many wonderful works there. He couldn't do any miracles there because of their unbelief. You see, that's the only thing that stops faith is unbelief. Right. Amen. If you believe God is almighty, if you believe God can do it, guess what? God can do it. Right. Amen. As long as you don't go out the parameters of this blessed book. I think what we need to do is we need to let our God grow in our faith. Amen? Amen? We need to let God be bigger than us. 
And we need to let God be bigger than our problems. And we need to let God be bigger than our sicknesses. We need to know that God is God. Amen. He is sovereign. Amen. He is in control. Amen. A lot of people look at the news these days wonder, but He is. He is in charge. And folks, listen. These things must happen in order for the Son of God to come back. Amen. Things are... Hey, I'd like to tell you this morning that things are going to get better. Some of it will. Some of it won't. Amen. We could, as a church in America, suffer greater persecution than what we have. China people have. Russian people have. Third world country people have. We could have it. And now friends, listen. Just because they limited us a little bit, that's not real persecution. Persecution comes when you have to stand your ground and people want to stone you. People want to shoot you. People want to kill you. That's the true test. Is do I love Jesus enough to live for Him? And do I love Him enough to die for Him? Amen. And it might get to that. I'm not saying it is. You might go on to be the Lord before it happens. But if some of us that remain here, we could see, even in America, a great persecution. Remember, during persecutions, revivals normally break out. And people have been praying for revival for America. Amen. So, great multitudes followed Him. Notice where they followed Him. From Galilee, from Decapolis from Jerusalem, from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. They came from everywhere because they heard the Word. And so Jesus goes up on the mount and He sits down. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is compiled in three chapters in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And this sermon is the establishment of King Jesus of the characteristics and the principles which the people of God would possess as the citizens of the kingdom. These are what we're supposed to be possessing as His citizens. It contains three types of materials. It contains the Beatitudes or the Declaration of Blessedness. It considers ethical admonitions. And it contrasts between Jesus' ethical traditions and the Jewish legalistic traditions. Jesus shows there's a difference between those who want to uphold the law and just the law and those who become children of grace. More is expected of us. Mm -hmm. The sermon ends with a short parable that stresses the importance of practicing what Jesus had just been teaching. It is an expression of amazement by the crowds of the authority which Jesus spoke. They were, they were astounded. Jesus did not study under a rabbi. In those days, until you were brought to the rank of a rabbi, you would have to say, whoever your rabbi was, Rabbi Ben Ezra says, and then you add. But if you spoke it directly like Jesus did, you spoke with one as authority. So although Jesus didn't go to any rabbinical schools, He went to the school at the Father's feet. <laughs> He came to speak the Father's words. Mm -hmm. He came to do the Father's work. Mm -hmm. He came to obey the Father's will. He didn't need a rabbi. He was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. Amen. 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 And every time you look out there and see the beautiful sunshine and the trees, you behold His glory. Amen. The glory of the creation. Amen. If people don't believe in God, they're just ignorant and blind. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. You can't look at this stuff. Listen, the birth of a precious baby is one of the greatest things of creation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. That, that precious mother that's carried that precious life for some eight, nine months, some have carried it even further. When that child was born, there's great pain, yes, but there's also great joy. Mm -hmm. And isn't it interesting? Sometimes great pain brings great joy. Amen. And to see that precious child, amen, when it learns its first word, whether it be mama or daddy, amen. And sometimes, you know, they don't really say that. That's why the mom and dad wants them to say. 
<laughs> but it's a wonderful thing to think that actually the child said mama or actually the child said daddy. Why? Because it's a creation of God. Mm -hmm. And how people can destroy the creation of God is beyond me. Mm -hmm. It is beyond me. The sermon as, is a standard for all Christians. He, Jesus realized that his demands cannot be met by our own power. But needed an enabler to assist and to develop them. This is why he told his disciples, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go away, I will send another Comforter unto you. Which is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God enables us to develop these characteristics in. It is the work of the Spirit of God to transform us. And not only in transform us, He is the one that places it within us. And it is He that stirs us up with a desire to do it. Amen. He gives us a passion to be us, like Jesus. He's given us all things pertaining unto godliness. Yes. Yes. And that's the next thing that's interesting that she would say that. Because the sermon does not present the way of salvation, but the way of righteous living for those who are in God's family. Contrasting the new way with the old one of the scribes and the Pharisees. The Sermon on the Mount teaches us how to live godly. And it is empowered by the Spirit of God. It is a detailed revelation of the righteousness of God and its, its principles are applicable to us today. This was not just for the people of that day. They are for us and our preparation for the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes describe the inner qualities of a follower of Christ and promises him blessings in the future. Now when Jesus came up, he took the normal position of a teacher. He went up in the mount. He sat down and he began to teach. And what did he say? Blessed. The word blessed is used in verses 3 through 12. And it's more than being happy. It is more than emotion that is often dependent on outward circumstances. Blessed is a gracious act of God. Whereby the believer receives a state of of ultimate well-being and distinctive spiritual joy of those who share in the salvation of the kingdom of God. God imparts His joy to us. Blessed are those who revere the Lord. Blessed are those who do His will. Blessed are those who put their unconditional and complete trust in God. Amen. They live under the assurance and experience that they are living under the guardianship and faithful care of the gracious Lord of life. God will take care of you. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? God will take care of you. So Jesus presents nine Beatitudes of the Kingdom. The first three include the poor in spirit, those who mourn, and the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the Kingdom of Heaven. Now the poor in the spirit does not mean that the citizens of Kingdom are deplete of anything. As we think, of a poor man being depleted of wealth, nor a poor man who we feel sorry for. But rather, the statement is in direct contrast to the spiritually proud and the self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the humble mm -hmm. in spirit. In other words, they are people who have emptied themselves of self, and they have surrendered themselves and their will to God. Mm -hmm. They've humbled themselves. Jesus taught that they who were poor or humble in spirit are blessed to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is not something we earn. It is a gracious gift of God Amen. to all those who will humble themselves and believe in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed are they that mourn. A lot of times we read this, we think about people who have lost a loved one, but for our friends it's more than that. Blessed are they mine, for they shall be comforted. Mourning for the Jews included the act of repentance as well as for grief. The penitent took the position of one who was grieving that they had disobeyed the commandment of God by an act of sin. They would sit in sackcloth and ashes. This was the same position that David took when he sinned with Bathsheba and he hoped that that judgment on his son would pass away. But that's just as soon as the son died, he washed himself, which surprised everybody. It was the same position that Job took when he lost his wealth and he lost his children. 
It's the same position that the people of God mourned over both personal and corporate sins. True repentance must be marked by true remorse, being grieved for offending God and a willingness to turn from sin. You cannot be repented if you don't turn from the sin. Amen. You have to turn away from it. This beatitude also brings hope for those who are mourning over the loss of a loved one that's died. Both the repentant sinner and the grieving child of God are promises to be comforted by God. How is it? God said that He would send the comforter to us. God said He would forgive our sins. Isn't that a comfort? That if you fall, you can be comforted. Amen? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This beatitude is taken from Psalm 37, 11. These are those who humbly acknowledge that their dependence on the goodness and grace of God and display no arrogance towards others. It refers to a disposition before God, namely humility, and guides our attitudes and behavior towards other people. It is a person who knows his or her authority and power, but does not exploit them to the harm of others. These will inherit the earth, the new promised land, they will receive from the Lord secure entitlement to the promised land and as the created, redeemed sphere and bountiful source of provision for the life of God's people as referred to in Revelation 21. We shall inherit the new heaven and new earth. You see, a meek person is not weak. A meek person knows his authority. He knows who's behind him. He knows where his authority comes from. But just because he knows his authority, he does not lord it over anybody. In fact, he humbles himself and becomes a servant to them. That's a meek person. Amen? But that same meek person can stand up in the power of God's Spirit and offend, be offended and come against sin. He can speak against sin. He can speak against evil or sheep. They can speak because they are meek and they have the authority. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore. What was it saying? You're going under my authority and my power. You have the power to speak against sin. You have power to speak against the evil in your family, in your business, or those people around. You have the power to speak against it. And you know what? The greatest power you have? Prayer. Your knees before God. Wouldn't it be wonderful? If more of them was like St. Patrick, who Mary, Queen of Scots, feared his prayers more than all the armies of Europe, she, afraid, she was afraid of this man of God because he prayed, and when he prayed, God heard. Don't you know when you pray with earnesty, when you pray unto God Almighty, God hears and God acts. The first three characteristics of the kingdom as taught by Christ are humility, it's a pliable heart that can be moved by grief over the loss of a loved one, a friend, an associate, an acquaintance, as well as remorse for sin and the willingness to repent. And finally, it's meekness. These three provide access to the kingdom of heaven, comfort by God through their grief and forgiveness for their sin, and an inheritance of the earth that will be free from sin in the kingdom of heaven and of God. This morning, let's open our hearts and acquire and practice these attitudes or characteristics. We need to be humble. We need to be mournful over our sin and repent. We need to be meek and show people that God is strong. Amen? As our brother comes.